Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Colligan and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. With me as always in these virtual spirituality events is Father Jerry Blauschek, who is our alumni chaplain and special assistant to the president. And he and I are both so thrilled to welcome our special guest this evening, Father Joseph O'Keefe. Father O'Keefe is the provincial of the USA East province of the Society of Jesus. And we'll go into good detail about what that role entails, but he is largely responsible for the formation and the well-being of the priests and the brothers in his province. So I know you're all so excited to hear from him, uh, and I don't want to delay that any longer, so I'll just go quickly over a couple of housekeeping items, and then we will get started. First, I ask that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the conversation, just to make sure that you are not providing any background noise or distraction. And second, I recommend that you use speaker view rather than gallery view in Zoom, just to keep the focus of your screen on our speakers. And finally, if you have any questions that come up during the discussion, we encourage you to submit them using the chat feature in Zoom. And if time permits at the end, we'll do our best to get to some of them as we are able. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry to get us started. Thank you so much, Jess. And thank you, uh, Father Joseph O'Keefe, for being so gracious. Uh, as he'll explain in a minute, he's been busy all day. He's been listening to people and paying attention to people uh, and that we would prevail on him to give us his free evening to be able to speak with us. Well, it bespeaks his kindness and his, and his, uh, and his generosity with his time. Uh, every year, a Jesuit provincial visits the local communities uh, of his province. And uh, that visitation of the province is not surveillance. It's to do what Father O'Keefe, I think, arguably does best and most importantly, what we Jesuits call spiritual governance. That means as he has to plan uh, with the Jesuits in our province, which extends from Maine, Georgia, uh, and includes 578 Jesuits. Father O'Keefe may say more about the works we do but Father O'Keefe in the institutions, which I should say do include 11 colleges or universities, 22 high schools, eight middle schools, 19 parishes, and four retreat centers. He may give us more details about those. So Father O'Keefe both visits the institutions and our colleagues and friends and associates uh, who are keeping those institutions active and creative and fruitful. He will always visit the local bishop but his key and most important uh, challenge and responsibility is to speak to the likes of me and other Jesuits to encourage us in our own vocations, uh, to encourage us in the quality of our religious and community lives, uh, and to know us individually and to invite us into the sort of conversations that allow him to be a good superior and plan uh, with our associates and with the bishops and with the Father General. We'll have a lot to say about that in the course of our of our time, uh, of how centralized we are. Parenthetically, we did not elect this man. Uh, not that we wouldn't. I think we would elect, if we had a referendum now, we'd say, stay on, Joe. Uh, but it's the general of the society uh, who appoints the provincial, the regional superior. The society is divided up into provinces. Maybe, Joe, um, a way to have people understand what you do when you visit us is to say, what did you do today? Okay, sure. So um, I think the most privileged uh, and the best sense of the word thing I do is to really listen to my brothers uh, and to understand their joys and their challenges, uh, their ministries, what they're thinking about in their current life, what is they look ahead, what do they foresee, what are they, and, and hearing from their superior, what do they seem to be really good at? What are they not as good at? <laughs> and, and that then becomes, so, so knowing the men, and now I'm in my fourth year, right? So this is the fourth meeting. Now, I knew a number of, of these men beforehand, but to know them in, in this new way, and a number I didn't know. Um, so when I think about here are the needs that we have in the province, and here are the men, where's the match of what's happening inside the man and his prayer? 
and, 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 and where he finds life and how can that fit the needs that we have? And so my conversations, yeah, pastoral, in many ways, I'm the pastor for Jesuits in the province, uh, but also it's mission focused mm -hmm. and it helps me determine allocation of, of, of human resources in the best possible way. So you saw some Jesuits today, and then I think you visited Bishop uh, Caggiano, correct? That was yesterday, yep. Visited oh, that was yesterday. Caggiano. All right, so that is something that a provincial will always do, right? Absolutely, and President Nemec. Uh, and today, the board chair. So I always visit with board chairs. That was by Zoom. Okay. Board chair, president. The, well, the presidents also are what we call directors of the work uh, because they're directors of a Jesuit work. So meeting with Christian Cashman and meeting with Mark Nemec. Uh, and again, it's, 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 you know, meeting with them each time I come and getting a sense of their perspective, not only on the individual Jesuits who are working here, but also on the Jesuit identity uh, that they are responsible to uh, flourish, to, to, to maintain and to grow. And that's a very important point that the provincial speaks to our two lay presidents and asks them, what are you and what are your institutions doing to make sure that these institutions founded and sponsored by the Jesuits are remaining Jesuit? I have to imagine that's a big part of your conversation with them, Joe. It certainly is. And also um, getting a sense of which Jesuits are particularly helpful and, and are there any issues that they've noticed that I should be attentive to, to help the man? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what do they, how can the province help them? And of course, they always say, send lots more very competent Jesuits. It's like, okay, but uh, there aren't that many horses in the stable anymore. So, uh, mm -hmm. but it's always a cordial conversation. And, and in the case of both Mark and Christian uh, at university and prep, uh, it's very cordial. Uh, Bishop Caggiano is extraordinarily gracious. Uh, of course, an alum of Regis High School. So he is an alum of a Jesuit school himself and did his uh, seminary work and graduate work at the Gregorian, so Jesuit educated. Um, not only that, but he has a real sense of the importance of, of the role of Fairfield in his diocese. I know, Joe, he's always talking to me and to us about, uh, you know, education, uh, yep. but especially, but also the role, you know, of, of Ignatian spirituality, retreats, confessors, helping lay people, religious and the priests, to have a, a deep spiritual life. I, I'm imagining that probably came up with him today, too. Well, he's absolutely. Afraid. You know, and, and I mean, it happens that uh, Jesuits do that kind of work with people in dioceses all over the place. Um, I think here especially, uh, thank God to the Murphy Center, you know, which <clears throat> is del a deliberate part of the university to to foster that kind of ministry of the Jesuits. Um, and, and both within the university here, but also outside the university. Uh, and the impact that that Murphy Center has and has had uh, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And certainly mm -hmm. the local bishop, clearly Bishop Caggiano clearly sees that and understands that. Joe, in your travels, did you have a chance to get over to our Bellarmine campus yet? I did. You know, I, I said to Kevin O'Brien, I said, Kevin, you know, if you had tried to describe this physical plant to me, I would not have been able to imagine it. I mean, it's so creative and beautifully done, but more significantly, of course, are the students who are there. Uh, and, you know, the creation of educational opportunities uh, for students who, you know, from Bridgeport and other places, but from, you know, recent immigrants. I mean, that's been so much part of our Jesuit history in this East Coast is first-generation students and immigrants and ethnically diverse people. Uh, and to see that alive at Bellarmine is an extraordinary commitment on the part of the university. Uh, and it's a commitment to, you know, where Fairfield has a very broad um, catchment area of, in terms of students and a, and a broad impact. But it's especially important to see the local impact of the university, too. Uh, and Bellarmine is a classic example of that. And, and I'm sure, and I know already it is a model for other Jesuit universities. 
So I think the replication of Bellarmine uh, will be an important gift to the society. Another role that Joe has as provincial is really being our bridge uh, um, to our to our, our universal governance with Father General, our Superior General in Rome. And I think uh, anybody who's followed these conversations seriously in the last few years has heard us talk about uh, the universal apostolic preferences uh, that Father General, after extensive consultation, articulated for all institutions sponsored and connected to the Jesuits. Uh, and certainly Father O'Keefe has a major responsibility to make sure that those preferences, in fact, are shaping all of our institutions. And Joe, right off the bat, we have two of those preferences, right? Uh, with yeah. Bellarmine and with the and with the Murphy Center. Well, yeah, and and I think you know those preferences. I mean, the first, uh, I think, many a, a more contemporary articulation of something that has been at the heart of the society since its foundation in 1540 uh, is the spiritual exercises and that spiritual vision of Ignatius uh, accompanying people as they discern and search for Christ and search for meaning in their lives. So that clearly is is there. Um, the working with the marginal and the excluded. And in many ways, I think that's an articulation of something that started in, in Vatican II, a faith that does justice. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and again, being with those on the margins of society, uh, being with people who uh, come from backgrounds of poverty, uh, who uh, educational opportunity is what's going to give them a a full and a productive life. Uh, and then the third, uh, which is giving young people a hope-filled future. I mean, our first educational institution in Messina in 1548, right? Um, so this is a long standing. And I often think, you know, each generation has had its challenges, but given all that's happening in the world today, the challenge of giving young people a hope-filled future, uh, and and that's very much part of the educational enterprise. So I think you know, and 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 of course the fourth, and part of that hope-filled future is having a, a an earth that is sustainable. You know, air to breathe, water to drink, uh, the whole climate issue. Looking at the name, and, and it was by the way a mandate from the Holy Father. It was a right. mandate from the Pope to the society, saying these are the preferences, and then. It is for each of us provincials in our own place. What does that mean in our time and place? And, you know, given the worldwide society, right, the, the over 14,000 Jesuits across the world and 3,700 different educational institutions, you know, each place has its own political, economic, religious, ethnic culture. So they're broad uh, preferences that need to be take on flesh in a particular circumstance, if you will. Thank you, Joe. Look, we jumped immediately into your role as provincial, but you weren't born provincial. I was as not. I understand it, you were born a simple child of Irish and uh, Franco-Canadian, uh, Franco-American uh, parents in Salem, Massachusetts, where I'm yeah. proud to say, well, I, I served my first years right. as a young priest, as a baby yeah. priest in a parish not too far from yours. I was in St. Mary's at Italian parish where I ate very well and tried to be a good priest. Yeah, yeah. But Joe, how did you? Yeah, so you were born in Salem, right? Right. And where did you go to high school? I went to a Zaverian Brothers High School, St. John's Prep in Danvers, Massachusetts. Much, much, a great school. Still, a still a major rival of a BC, isn't it? Absolutely. BC High. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's then how did you meet this society? Yeah. How did you meet this society, Joe? So uh, in my family background, my grandfather was class of 1916 at Holy Cross. 1916? Yeah, he went to BC High 1912, 1916 at Holy Cross. And then my father uh, and my uncle Bob, uh, when they returned from the war in the Pacific, my dad a sailor, my uncle Bob a Marine, uh, my grandfather said, well, let me take you to Holy Cross and because you've got to go to college. And they're like, <laughs> Lights out at 10 o'clock, all these strict rules at Holy Cross. Ah. They're like, no way. We have just been, you know, again, they were older, obviously, having been in the war. 
so my Uncle Bob was class of 49 at Boston College and my dad was class of 50. <clears throat> But my uncle Ed was class of 51 at Holy Cross because he was younger. He was not in the war. Um, and then when it came time for me to go to college, um, I was like a little rebellious, like, you know, uh, this family Jesuit tradition thing, Jesuit education. I was thinking of Middlebury and Bowdoin and these, you know, New England liberal arts colleges. And a classmate of mine at Holy Cross at, at St. John's Prep said, you know, we can get a day off of school as a senior year if we go to a college and I have an appointment at Holy Cross and I have my father's car. So let's go. I said, great. With no intention. Well, I was I was totally <clears throat> won over by the people I met there. And I remember coming back home at dinner at the table saying, well, I know where I'm going to Holy Cross. And they're like, what? <laughs> and the rest is history, right? Well, what was it? What are those those people who had this magical influence on you, on this contentious, you know, young man who was, you know, who wanted to do anything but what his parents wanted? How how did they win you over? Well, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. Jesuits. Uh, it it's been really amazing too. Now that I'm the for those still alive. Now that I'm the provincial for these men. Uh, who met me when I was 17 years old and a freshman. Wow. wow. Um, the impact of, <clears throat> of, of the Jesuits there. Now, some were curmudgeons. We know <laughs> certainly not. No, none of you, by the way, none of our, but, but just to be said, just to be clear, Joe, none of our, none of our participants have ever met. Oh, would have ever encountered that. No, no, no sure. nothing like that. No. But you know, but please go men, on. <laughs> these were men who were learned. Um, who really took seriously the, the world as it was. Uh, they were very much imbued with the Vatican, uh, spirit of Vatican II. This is 1972 I started. Um, and, and, and a real passion for, for learning and, 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 and a brotherhood among them that they really cared for one another. And they would tease each other and they would share their life with each other. And uh, and it was just a very appealing and very attractive thing for me. Now, I, it, it was both from family background and all, get your bachelor's degree and then let's look at this again, which is of course what happened. So I did graduate in 1976 from, from Holy Cross. Uh, but you were almost from the beginning thinking about a, a Jesuit vocation and emulation? I was thinking about a men? priestly vocation. Priestly vocation. And part of it, too, God love him, my dad died after my freshman year at Holy Cross. Mm. And I felt responsible for my mother and sister and thought, mm. you know, maybe I could be a diocesan priest mm -hmm. in the Boston Archdiocese. And I knew priests, too, because I had done a lot of work as an orderly in hospitals to kind of pay my way through college. Mm. Uh, and then when my mother, God love her, uh, met a man and decided to remarry, all of a sudden it's like, I can be a Jesuit. She's going to be wow. a Jesuit. So kind of God cleared the way for me to enter the society. So I, I graduated in May of 76, and I entered the Jesuits in August of 1976. And what what was your novitiate like? What what if what were the salient moments of your you've heard, I mean, the, these all your your hearers have heard, most of them have heard other Jesuit stories. So the terminology yeah. of things like novitiate are not utterly new to most of our right, participants. Right, right. So, well, of course, you're yeah. the first two years of our right. Jesuit formation. Where did you do those, Joe? And what was it, it like? What, it was was, at, what at, were the salient points? Right, at Newbury Street in Boston. Um, and They're uh, not in Shadowbrook anymore. No, no, they moved maybe five years previous out of Shadowbrook. Because most of the people we've interviewed, uh, you know, people like Charlie Allen or Mike. Sure, they Allen would have been in Shadowbrook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, you know, the high point of it, uh, obviously, uh, in my first year was the 30-day uh, retreat. Mm. Uh, I had been to Gloucester as a high school kid for a day of recollection, and then a version of the exercises when I was at Holy Cross for five days. Uh, it was kind of fun. I was, I was at a <clears throat> reunion at Holy Cross last week, the 50th anniversary of co-education, and we were laughing with some of the uh, my colleagues, women uh, especially, saying, "Remember trying to keep silent during that retreat?" There's, a... 
So doing it for 30 days, I did learn how to keep silent. Um, and, and again, growing up just down the North Shore from Gloucester, uh, a beautiful place for me and an important place. Mm -hmm. uh, I was then with three other Jesuits sent on an, what we call experiments, as you know, which is a way of testing vocation in different settings. So I was sent to India with three other New England Jesuits. Wow. Well, you were a novice. For six months as a novice. Yeah. Uh, so this was a big, this was very important in a Jesuit way of formation, very different from the monastic uh, or or uh, seminaries that well, well there weren't seminaries early on to train priests for parishes but the monastic communities trained people by keeping them in the monasteries but with ignatius since he envisioned us to be on the road uh, as our primary way of being and to be available to to be sent to any culture any 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 area of the world uh, so ignatius prescri prescribes in our constitutions that the novices have this experiment of being on pilgrimage. Are they capable, as somebody who wants to be a Jesuit, okay. are they capable of exhibiting the capacity to relate to new cultures, leave their own securities behind, uh, and meet God in the unexpected? So that's just a little commercial about why experiments okay. are such a big deal for Jesuits. And so we were at mission stations in central India and then in Calcutta with the Sisters of Charity. Wow. Um, the home for the dying, the uh, hospice there uh, in the morning, <clears throat> and then in the afternoon uh, in the orphanage. So end of life, beginning of life, an experience wow. of being with those people. Six um, months. <clears throat> and, you know, interesting, actually, one of the mornings working in Calcutta, went to very early morning mass, and I was right next to Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa actually was a classmate of mine. She got wow. an honorary doctorate when I got my bachelor's degree from Holy Cross. So, oh my goodness! There I was, like seven months later, sitting next to her, um, and and so that that was an extraordinary uh, multicultural experience, and and uh, being with the Indian novices too, and and you know understanding that it's one society of Jesus across right. the world, and, and right. just a brief anecdote that. Uh, when I was at, uh, I was a delegate at the 36th General Congregation uh, and a delegate from the Patna province, Susairaj. And a couple of days into the congregation, I said, Susai, do you remember the New England novices who came in? He said, I do. Later that day, he sent me a JPEG of a picture of the New England novices and the Indian novices. Both he and I were there. It's like, who would have thought we'd be at a general yeah. congregation all these decades yeah. later? You know, so it's amazing how things happen. So, and and then in my second year, again back in in Boston, learning about the society, um, doing pastor. I did a lot of work with a group called Samaritans. Mm -hmm. Samaritans, it's a it's a it's a uh, hotline for people who were suicidal. Uh, and then I went to Fall River, Massachusetts, and taught French full time in the high okay. school. And then you know, so much of it gave my whetted my appetite to be an educator. Great. You know, when, when Father O'Keefe mentions being sent to India, um, he averted to the fact that Jesuits, from the very beginning of their orientation, their formation, uh, are, um, I think, imbued, if we do it well, with the notion that there's one society, and it's a global society, and the Northeast, U.S. Northeast province may be your port of entry into the society, but that you are, you enter a worldwide society and you are available in principle. And for most of us, there's been some moment when in reality, we're asked to be available, to be of service way beyond our geographical uh, moorings and to be available wherever the church needs us. And this goes all the way back the reason, Joe, by the way, I'm doing this is because this is under the aegis of Ignatian spirituality sure. and introducing people to Jesuit stuff. So this is an opportunity I couldn't I couldn't miss. Right. Uh, if, if from the beginning Ignatius understood the Society of Jesus was not uh, was not instituted to serve a particular geographical or cultural or linguistic uh, area, but pr he presented himself to the Holy Father and said. We are available to you wherever there is the greatest. And that's not that's not a platitude. 
Joe, you can, you know, having been in Rome and being in your position, you understand that it does indeed happen that bishops and the Holy Father and the congregations in Rome <clears throat> they turn to the Jesuits and say, you know what, we need <clears throat> one of a young Jesuit, well, no longer young, <clears throat> that I worked extensively with is now the apostolic bishop, the apostolic delegate, or not, sorry, whatever, an apostolic administrator of Kyrgyzstan. Because at oh, one yeah. stage, the Holy Father said, okay, you Jesuits, I need you to, 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 to help refound and, and help sustain the church in Kyrgyzstan, uh, one of those uh, former Soviet republics on the Silk Road. Anyway, Joe, you mentioned French. Uh, <clears throat> French, French language, French culture, and French education uh, was a real trajectory that you followed throughout your whole uh, Jesuit formation, right? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I was a philosophy major at Holy Cross with a minor in French. Part of it might have been, too, my kind of ethnic heritage on my mother's side. Um, but then uh, when I finished, yeah. university, I took vows, and then we go to philosophy studies, or what we call first studies. And the fact that I had had a major in philosophy I did some philosophy courses and took the comprehensive exam at Fordham for that, the, the De Universa exam, as it's called in Jesuit world. Uh, and then I did an MA in French literature. At Fordham. At Fordham. Uh, and um, of course, you know, I had studied Sartre as a philosopher, and now I study Sartre as, a, as an author. So I studied Descartes for his philosophical stuff. Now I study Descartes for his stylistic, you know, work. Um, so, and, and with that in hand, uh, after that experience, and, and I went back to Fordham many, many years later to be the superior of young Jesuits studying at Fordham Scholastics. So mm. it was a big circle back to, to the Bronx. Um, and, and then with that degree in French, uh, I went to Chevers High School in Portland, Maine and taught full-time for three years. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Jesuits, you know that what Father O'Keefe is referring to, the for the the, uh, the pattern of formation from novitiate initially two or two years of orientation and experiments, and then philosophy studies, and then always a period of apostolic work, where um, in a certain sense uh, you once again live out what is a, an anticipation of what your Jesuit life is going to be like. Uh, and uh, and it's a confirmation. Is this the grace that God is giving me? And was it for you, Joe? Apparently it was. It certainly was. Um, you know, I loved my time. And again, you know, when I was a novice, I taught also. And so high school teaching was a real passion of mine and and, and education in the educational process. And, and that continued and was, um, you know. What'd you like so much about high school teaching? They look pretty pesky to me and problematic. All those hormones and all that. Oh, all well, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's actually so many of them I keep up with. Some of the biggest bandits ended up being the most loyal alumni. You know? mm. And, mm. and and you're with them. Um, and there's a great sense of, of joy in that. And the other aspect of it, too, uh, when I was in Regency, wonderful lay women and men who were mm. Um and while they were lay people and I was a Jesuit, but but we were in this together. And I think that's a crucial part of that Regency experience. And now I see it with our young guys who do Regency experiences and who become such wonderful colleagues and friends of our lay teachers. Mm. That's important. certainly the story that, that we keep hearing from uh, Fairfield Prep. Yeah. You know, um, previous to you last year, was it the year before, Jessica, we had Brendan Coffey, a young Jesuit regent. That's our term, our terminology for these kind of interns uh, who are doing full-time work in a Jesuit-sponsored ministry. And Brendan, whom some of you have met, uh, was at Fairfield Prep. And uh, his impact on not only his students and their families, but his impact uh, just by the nature of his warmth and generosity and competence uh, and openness to his uh, colleagues at Fairfield Prep was was legendary. Uh, so I'm not surprised that the same would have happened for you. Well, and I had the great privilege and joy of being Brendan's superior when he was studying at Fordham. Uh -huh. At Chiswick Hall. So I was his rector for two years. All right. So 
you know, I, so you were you were you were a regent, then you, I'm not sorry, you were scholastic or a regent or a young Jesuit in formation, and then where did you do your theology studies? Uh, at what was then the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, okay. Massachusetts, uh, which is now a division of Boston College. Okay. So okay. I, I am div there. I was ordained in 1986, uh, 1985 to the diaconate, 1986 to the priesthood. Uh, and then I did a second theology degree called the licentiate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was under the um, tutelage of John O'Malley, the oh, well known. Those of you who know that name, the great Jesuit historian, great all time Jesuit John O'Malley. So I had this passion for history and especially. Uh -huh. in passion for French. And so uh, under John's direction, took some courses in Cambridge, but then also went to France to do uh -huh. research about uh, Jesuit schools in the fifth, late 16th, early 17th century. And Was that uh, one of those rare moments when we were allowed to exist in France? That's absolutely, yes. It was early on. And this was actually in Lorraine, as the places that I was looking at was its own separate, uh, there was a Duke of Lorraine who invited us. So but working under John O'Malley and having had him in classes uh, had a big impact uh, mm. on me. In what uh, way, Joe? In what way, Joe? Well, he was so erudite and thoughtful and mm. humble and um, a very regular person. He didn't yeah. put on airs, and yet he had all the goods. I mean, an eminent historian, uh, you know, with all kinds of awards and. Um, so yeah, he was he was certainly one of the greats and a great mentor of mine. Um, all of his books, as far as I remember, all published by Harvard Press, yeah. where you ended up. Did you, right. Was it uh, you ended up going back to Harvard? Well, I came back Harvard? after my licentiate, and I thought, you know, I'm really interested in how educational institutions form people, the culture of educational institutions, and the role of schools, not only in terms of transmitting knowledge and skills, but also of formation of people and thought, you know, I've looked at that in France in the 16th and 17th centuries. I'd like to look at it in the U.S. in the 20th century. Wow. Uh, and so that's why I was, I petitioned and was given permission to do a doctorate in education. I did that at Harvard. Um, okay. And uh, oh. my work was with a woman named Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, one of the first African-American fully tenured professors endowed professorship at Harvard. Um, and I was very interested in how Jesuit schools, Jesuit high schools in particular, uh, looking back to the time of John Lafarge and others, became desegregated and welcomed mm -hmm. more diverse populations of mm -hmm. income people and African Americans and Latinos uh, and immigrants in Metro New York. So it was a wonderful opportunity to study Jesuit schools again, but in a way that's not history, but it's present it, and, and, and looking to the future. And so when I think about my work in education, you know, that, that was enormously helpful. And of course, the people I met and the resources at Harvard are tremendous. And, you know, the, the, not only the faculty that were there, but the students who were attracted and the rich variety of backgrounds. And it was an eye-opening experience for me. Joe, with, with, with the, you know, with the, with the uh, dearth of clergy, with the vocation crisis, with so few uh, priests and Jesuits uh, being available to education, uh, why do you think the society, even now, should put so much effort into education? And why, why do you see, for, you know, what, what is so specific? Uh, or can you talk about something that is so specific to what, what, how would you characterize the, the, the Ignatian Jesuit charism vis-a-vis -vis education? And I'm again, you're, you're talking to folks, many of whom uh, have been recipients and participants in this, in this mission. So how, with, with your study, with your own, your, your personal experience, your family history, your, uh, your wonderful academic uh, formation and continued experience, because that, to jump ahead, Joe, was how many years uh, at BC? At BC's 25 BC. years on the faculty at BC, yeah. Right, and then dean for how many years? I, I was associate dean for academics at the School of Ed for two years, and then dean for six. All right. So, with that background in mind, what's the big deal about Jesuit education? Well, you know, increasingly, when I look at the world the way it is now, 
I think back to a previous a general, Father Adolfo Nicolás. And in 2010, he gave an address at the Jesuit University in Mexico City. It was for Jesuits and higher ed from around the world. I was one of the BC representatives. Um, and he talked about the danger of what he called the globalization of superficiality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sound bites, lack of analysis, polarization, demonizing those who think differently. I mean, we're just seeing so much of that has come to light. And he said, Jesuit education is Jesuit education for depth. For depth. Depth of thought, depth of imagination, depth of values. Mm. Um, and I think given the superficiality that is so much around us, that graduates of Fairfield and other places, how do we help them do the hard work of depth of analysis and imagination uh, and also commitment to the greater good. Mm. Um, you know, and that can be no matter what field you're in, you know, so talking to folks here about, well, there's Bellman, right? But like the new nursing school, for example, in Austin and, and the wonderful nursing school here, what is it like, like to be a nurse who's been, who's, prepared for that career in a mm. Jesuit school in terms of care of the person, uh, in terms of passion for uh, access to health care, no matter what your income level, um, those kinds of, when I look at the number of students here in the uh, business school, right, um, ethical business practices, corporate responsibility, uh, how businesses uh, care about the communities in which they're located? How do they build them up? Um, you know, so in an array of professions, no matter what, uh, I think arguably, ar arguably it's never been as, important, been as important to have a Jesuit education as it is in our day and time. Thank you, Joe. Joe. Biased, of course, when I say that, but I, that's what I believe. And that's why I, that's how I spend my life dedicated to that reality you know and you do and you do i'm already i'm away i'm alert we're alert to the fact that the, the clock is moving and i can't uh, i can't restrain myself from asking uh, what's it like to be provincial what are the joys what are the sorrows what are the lights what are the shadows sure, yeah. um, i mean i i i don't want to I warned you that I might ask you this, but, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, be as personal or not as you like. But, you know, if you could tell us what that's like, because, yeah. you know, you're talking about 578 Jesuits at a time of, uh, uh, well, I mean, I'll let you describe it. What's it been like for you? Well, I think, you know, um, it's now year four, which is likely to be uh, six years is the normal uh, tenure. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I think it's important to, to mention uh, is the vastness of, of, of this. So when I became provincial on July 31st, 2020, it was the first day of the East Coast province. Uh, so uh, people would know, especially if they're from Connecticut, back in 2014, New York and New England came together. Uh, the wedding of the Yankees and the Red Sox, which is miraculous, huh? Uh, but we survived and did well. Not uh, without some challenges, but go ahead. There were some challenges. That's a Northeast province. Uh, and then uh, on July 31st, 2020, became the East Coast province. So, I mean, if you, you mentioned the number of institutions, the number of Jesuits. So it's huge. It's, it's, it's big. Um, so how to keep on top of everything. Uh, I have to say the most consoling part of it is being with Jesuits, as you mentioned, in that manifestation of the account of conscience. And someone described it to me, it's like having a front row seat to watch God at work in someone's life. And, and, and that's a great, it's humbling, it's a privilege, it's consoling. So I think being a pastor to, to my brothers mm -hmm. uh, is important. Being a pastor to the elders, you know, so many elderly Jesuits that I've met who say, you know, my prayer is really all about gratitude. And for some of them, life was not always a bowl of cherries, right? So at age 69, I say to my note to self, 
grow old gracefully. Yeah. So with, with my elder brother, um, you know, what is it like for a young man to be, with all the distractions and noise in the world, to be able to hear a call to religious life and to have the courage to respond to that? And so I am, I am in such uh, awe of young men in this day and age uh, who were saying yes. And so when I accept young men into the society uh, and into the novitiate, and when I receive their first vows, and and when I present them to the bishop for ordination, uh, that, that's an enormous joy. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect of it is uh, I have come to realize how much our lay colleagues, not only by our mission, but care about us. Mm -hmm. And I communicate that to our, my brothers. They want us to live in vibrant communities. They want us to be full and 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 grounded human beings. Um, and, and, and the legacy that gets carried on by our lay women and lay men, you know, and, and we're at their side. So, so that's been a wonderful part of this. Um, and, and I think, you know, there is a future for us and for the society. Uh, I've often, I've been reflecting on the Sisters of Charity of New York, mm -hmm. who did such wonderful work as educators and as nurses and, you know, St. Vincent's Hospital during the AIDS crisis, how they've responded. Mm -hmm. And they've said, we're, we're going into what they call completion. That at they're not accepting any new members and they haven't had new members for years and that religious community will no longer exist that's not the case with us you know we have fewer numbers and and we look at the age distribution we only have 44 men in formation 44 wonderful men but 44 men in formation out of 578 jesuits right so we can't continue to be every place and do everything we've always done but there is a future and it's in good hands. Wow. What do you think, Jess? Should we, do you have any questions? Do you have any lists of questions yet? No, I think one thing, and we talked about this briefly, the three of us before we came on here is, you know, Father, you just mentioned there is a future, there are fewer, but what does that mean in your eyes specifically for a school like Fairfield when there are dwindling numbers of Jesuits? What does that mean going forward? And I know, as you said, the lay supporters and the lay followers are certainly, I'm sure, going to be an integral part in that. Uh, but could you speak a little bit more to what will continue to make Fairfield be a Jesuit school, even given the state of right. the, you know, the dwindling numbers? Great so, question, Jess. Great question. Yeah, so every higher ed institution goes through something called the Mission Priority Examine. A uh, parallel on the school level is the um, sponsorship review. And the mission priority exam consists of a self-study uh, on the campus. And well, first of all, does the institution want to remain Jesuit and Catholic? If it does, what is that? How has that become something other than just a brand label? Where is that realized in specific ways? Uh, and then um, getting people to buy into that. So it's a very broad-based consultation that leads to a report uh, that is submitted to the province and then a team of uh, qualified educators from other places uh, comes to see, is this report in fact what we're experiencing in our visit? Mm -hmm. So um, I've been on, before I became provincial, for uh, Regis University in Denver, for Santa Clara, Uni University of Santa Clara, and for Loyola Marymount. And actually, I was reflecting back, Nancy Della Valle from the Fairfield mm -hmm. faculty, she chaired the Loyola Marymount visit that I was on. So uh, that, along with the self-study, becomes a report uh, sent to me uh, as provincial, and with accompanying materials, all of that goes to Father General. And my recommendation, as I did, recommend that Fairfield continue to be sponsored by the society. It's the desire of the university that this happened from trustees to president administration and, and faculty. Uh, and it is by that that Father General uh, uh, approved the continuing 
sponsorship, if you will, of Fairfield by the society. Um, and by that, then the dicastery of culture and education that oversees Catholic education worldwide affirms the Catholic character. Uh, and all of that gets communicated to the local bishop, in this case, Bishop Caggiano. Um, and, you know, it, along at Fairfield, uh, things like um, continuing efforts uh, for access uh, for people who can't pay full freight of tuition. Certainly Bellarmine College is seen as a crucial piece of it. Uh, the very positive relationship with the local communities and the local dioceses. Um, and, and the efforts made both in the undergraduate core and in professional uh, programs <clears throat> make them distinctive because of the Catholic and Jesuit, the Catholic intellectual tradition and the focus on a faith that does justice. Um, so yeah, Fairfield has been reaffirmed and it's Catholic and Jesuit character. So, so that that's kind of the official piece. And then uh, otherwise it's, um, you know, working with lay people, but also Jesuits on campus, right? And I, and I think that the way to be effective is for Jesuits to have a, a strong corporate identity and to work together as opposed to individuals who just happen to be in different departments. It, it, the impact has to be a collective impact. Um, and that happens here. And that, that happens here. Um, so, yeah, and, and of course, if you have Jesuits who are productive and happy and engaged, uh, nothing attracts vocations like that. It's interesting, Joe, you talk about a corporate identity and that the, the, that identity of the body uh, extends even to people who are no longer here. I feel like Charlie Allen is still alive with us and that I still travel on the coattails of Charlie Allen uh, yeah, and the work absolutely. that we do, you know, whether it was him or, you know, Jesuits have been here over the years. Oh, God, yes. We continue their work. We continue, right. uh, you know, to capitalize on the goodwill and the good effects of their work. One aspect of your of your provincial it, uh, it takes you beyond frosty New England to the tropics of the far Pacific. Yes. Uh, and, and this is something that I know means a great deal to you, especially in you know uh, affirming uh, the values of Jesuit education. And that's the presence or the or the existence of Micronesia as part of a, where in the hell is Micronesia? And what, what, what did you see when you were there? Okay, so it's 8,000 miles away uh, in the middle of the Pacific. And uh, the Pope asked the society uh, mm -hmm. to uh, staff, really, those islands, the Federated States of, States of Micronesia uh, and the Caroline Islands. And um, they were Spaniards. But remember, Spaniards were neutral in World War II. And the Americans, of course, you know, took those islands from Japan and uh, said, no, I think we we'll, we need Jesuits here. But the American government said they should be American Jesuits. And, and so in 1945, uh, we arrived in Micronesia. Um, and it, uh, you know, it, it, it's a way of living out these apostolic preferences, for example, the impact of climate change. And some of these islands are will, will disappear with the rising ocean levels. And, and, and there are people who, uh, so many of whom live in poverty and we provide, especially through our schools and through our pastoral ministry. Now it just so happens and either coincidence or grace. So uh, as I was uh, listening uh, waiting for some of the Jesuits to come and speak to me. Father Mulraney, who had spent time in Micronesia, is a mentor for a Fairfield sophomore and a Fairfield freshman, both of whom went to that Savior High School in Chook. One of whom, and you saw the film that I showed for the community, he walked in, looked at me, he remembered my face from my Wow. Face. So here, and of course, you know, he's got this big heavy coat on me. <laughs> Micronesia is tropical. It's like, well, welcome to New England. And, uh, but the fact that he, the two of them are continuing the legacy of Fairfield University providing full scholarships. 
and, yeah. and these are the these are the leaders of Micronesia. Yeah, you know th these will be the physicians, and 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 the political leaders and the attorneys. Um, so it you know it it just brought Micronesia home to me in a wonderful way here at the Jesuit community center of uh, seeing those two kids and uh, and what Fairfield is doing for them. It's remarkable. This is all part, and these young people are here part, are part of the uh, the posse. What does it, Corey, call the, Corey Eunice and, and Mark Nemec call it the, uh, the Companions Program. Right, the Companions <clears throat> Program, yeah. yeah. Now, parenthetically, some of the graduates of our, of our high school, Xavier High School at Chuuk, end up going to the Jesuit universities in the Philippines. Oh, yeah. Some end up going to the Jesuit universities in Indonesia because Indonesia helps send young Jesuits to teach in our schools. And, and, Sophia, in Australia. In Tokyo, and Sophia in Tokyo? And Sophia in Japan. So, I mean, uh, this is the family uh, that we belong to. Um, Joe, I, we're reaching close to eight o'clock. I did want to offer anybody else the opportunity would you like to pose a question to Father O'Keefe? Further clarification of a, something that he's already said or some issue that you'd like him to turn his attention to? I did <clears throat> see one other question. It, it may be a larger topic than we want to get into with just a few minutes left, but um, questioning your opinion on other schools, not necessarily Jesuit, on suppressing speakers or tolerating animosity in the name of free speech. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Middle East or LGBTQ plus rights. Um, I don't know. That seems like maybe a longer conversation than a few yeah, minutes. It's certainly but... a very involved conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it would seem to me, at least off the top of my head, and please take it as that. This is not a well thought out argument, but uh, it would seem to me that there is back to that education depth of analysis, mm -hmm. right? And that if there are different points of view, it's the context in which those points of view are presented. Um, and it's never one-sided. Now, there are limits. Hate speech cannot be tolerated. Uh, incitement to violence can never be tolerated. Uh, um, but the university should be within those limits, a, a, a place for, for dialogue. Um, always with the understanding that Fairfield and its sister Jesuit institutions are not value-free institutions. That there is a way of looking at the world through the Catholic intellectual tradition uh, and through the legacy of the society that doesn't make it value neutral. That doesn't mean we are afraid of differing points of view. Easier said than done. I get all that. Um, I think when there are controversial issues or, uh, that arise, it's very important to inform, for example, the local bishop. And I am intent on that, and so are the heads of schools. Um, but I think a place where thoughtfully and carefully to present the Catholic perspective is, is crucial. I don't know if that... That's a good answer, but at least that off the top of Thank my head. Thank you. Joe very graciously uh, expressed that even in this moment when the society uh, is experiencing, you know, a demographic uh, decline, he pointed out that God has been very good to us in the quality of the young men that we have and that they are a source of hope. Um, I'm not just being polite, I'm being honest and and uh, and faithful when I say that God is taking very good care of us, even in this time of fewer fewer people available for service in the society to give us superiors like Father Joseph O'Keefe. So, Joe, thank you for your service to us, to our institutions, to our alumni, our colleagues, our friends, and thank you for spending this time with us this evening. And thank you to all of you who have taken the time uh, to learn about. Uh, to Joe to, to, to learn about us and to learn about Joe this evening. Thank you very much. 
And I want to offer my, my thanks as well. And I apologize if we weren't able to get to your questions, but we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. But thank you so much, Father O'Keefe, for being with us. Thank you, Father Jerry, as always, for being my wonderful partner in this. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you all so much for being here. Hey, God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.